from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Welcome to the North Idaho College Public Forum. Today we're going to start a five-week series entitled Universal Health Coverage in the United States, Can We Do It? This series has emerged out of a lecture uh, symposium at North Idaho College put on by the North Idaho College uh, Popcorn Forum and the North Idaho College Convocations series. Uh, on our programs, we're going to discuss many areas of the debate that's taking place in the United States concerning this very important domestic issue. In fact, many people say that's the number one issue domestically this year in our country. To start our program, we're going to run an eight-minute segment from one of our speakers that started out the symposium. Uh, our guest is uh, Heather Booth, who is the National Outreach Coordinator for the President Clinton Health Care Plan. At this time, we will run her eight-minute speech, and then we'll come back and have guests to respond. I'm very grateful that the university is doing this program and that Senators Craig and Kempthorne and Congressman LaRocco are there really engaging citizens in one of the most important issues we'll face, not just during this year, but potentially even in our lifetime. So I wanted to provide a little bit of a framework about what the nature of the health care crisis is and what the President's plan really provides. First of all, this health care crisis that we face is not just a question of figures that, that many people glaze over when they hear about. It's really a question of real people's lives. It's a question of families. And just to give one example about Rick and Sandy Reckaweg. He's an electrician, and they had very good health insurance and were convinced they were going to have a great life. And 12 years ago, their second son, Jeffrey, was born. And he had a problem called sleep apnea. And he would have died, but because of modern medical miracles and the potential and wonder of American science, in fact, Jeffrey now leads a wonderful life for a 12-year-old. He's a good student. He plays soccer. But he spent the first years of his life in the hospital. And as a result, Rick and Sandy, his parents, are $600,000 in debt and will never be out of debt again as long as they live. And Jeffrey, because he has now a previously existing health condition, he'll never be insured again as long as he lives unless we do something about it. These are the real faces of the health care crisis. For people in Idaho, you see the crisis in many forms, including in the cost of insurance. In 1980, the typical family in Idaho was paying about $1,200 in health care costs. In 1991, that family was paying over $3,000 in health care costs. And if we don't do something about it, the average family of four in Idaho will be paying over $6,700 unless we take action now. And so the president has engaged this debate, and we're anxious to engage the conversation with you and other places around the country. There are some who've made the um, proposal sound so complicated and difficult that people are confused about it. But in fact, we can understand complicated systems when we know the simple elements of them. For example, you may not know about the electrical wiring in the building where you are, but you know that you turn on a light switch and you get the light. You may not know how the combustion engine works, but you turn on the ignition and you can make your car run. And the same is true with a complicated system like health care, when in fact the President's proposal has just a few simple elements. The simple elements of the plan include really five basic points. The first, and I brought these charts to try and make it a little clearer because I'm not able to be with you in the audience there. The first is that it provides guaranteed private insurance that can never be taken away. The President's rejected a government insurance program, and it's also rejected no guarantee of coverage. 
Under the plan, there will be comprehensive benefits. There'll be no lifetime limits, so the problem that the Rekawegs had won't affect anyone else in this country. And there'll be insurance that can never be taken away. So that's really the first principle of the plan. The second principle is real insurance reform. This means that it will be illegal to drop coverage of anyone for any reason. It means your rates can't be raised even if you get sick. And there'll be no lifetime limits to be used to cut you off from insurance. And finally, there'll be no basis for discriminatory charges if you're older or have been sick or depending on where you live in the country. The third element is real choice. You can choose your own doctor and choose your own plan. Right now, because costs are rising so much, many employers are cutting down on the number of plans that they offer people as their option. And this will, in fact, increase consumer choice. And then, the fourth point is that it will preserve and really expand Medicare coverage for our senior citizens and those needing long-term care. It will protect doctor choice. It will also provide two new benefits covering prescription drug coverage, as well as long-term care coverage at home, which is now really where most people want that coverage. But under the current regulations, it's often less expensive for a family to place an elderly or uh, ill member of the family into a nursing home, even though they'd prefer to take care of that parent or, uh, or relative at home. And the fifth basic point is that health benefits will be guaranteed at work. This is how most people with private insurance currently receive their insurance. Eight out of 10 people with private insurance currently get it through their employer. Under the president's plan, we'll have a shared responsibility where if you're employed, you'll get your coverage at work. Small businesses will receive a discount to provide their coverage, and the unemployed will get help from the government just as they do now. So the overall elements of the plan are guaranteed private insurance, choice of the doctor, real insurance reform, so you'll never lose your insurance. Medicare will be preserved and expanded with the additional benefits and there'll be health benefits guaranteed at work, making the best of a private health care system. Those are the overall elements of the plan. We believe we can win health care reform in 1994, but only if people engage the debate as you're doing now and also act and work to reform it. We know there's been a lot of publicity and advertising and misinformation. Um, and we know there's some, like some insurance companies and others, that have been providing this misinformation to the public. But the president didn't design this proposal for the insurance companies. He designed it for you. He designed it as a way to help small businesses who now often provide health insurance, but at 35% more cost to them than often the largest businesses have to pay. He provides this outline of the plan for people around the country, for families like Rick and Sandy Reckerweg to make sure that no one is ever denied insurance for any reason and to see that in fact, we have guaranteed health coverage that can never be taken away. That's Rick, the I've over- i listening to uh, Miss Heather Booth, who is the National Outreach Coordinator for President Clinton's health plan. Now we're going to turn to our two guests that we have in the studio who have been part of this day's program, and they served on a panel at the campus at North Idaho College, and I'm very pleased to welcome to the program to respond to her comments and to other plans that <clears throat> are available. And I would add before introducing our guests that we also today uh, had Senator Larry Craig and uh, Senator Dirk Kempthorne, uh, both Republicans from Idaho, and Congressman Larry LaRocco, a Democrat. They too, uh, on our uh, campus, 
by satellite responded uh, to the different alternatives. Uh, we were very grateful to all of them uh, that they could be with us today. I welcome to the program, first of all, Mr. Randall Brink, who is a businessman and an author and is very active on uh, a number of issues and has studied this issue in great detail. Uh, Randall is a former student at Northwell College, and we're happy to have you back after all these Thank years. You. It's nice to be back. And our second guest is Marna Bateman, who is the Director of Oncology Services at the North Idaho Cancer Center, and she too has been a participant uh, on the panel today and has many uh, very important things to say about health care, and Marna welcomes Thank the you. program. And as always, I'm very pleased to have a regular two panelists to uh, join in the questioning of our guest today. First of all, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho, and next to her is Steve Schink, who is the Dean of College Relations and Development at North Idaho College, and I shall ask Janelle to commence our questioning for our guest. My first question will be for you, Randall, and uh, then Marta can also chime in later, but the question that I have really has to do with why are we so concerned about this in the 1990s? What kinds of factors have made this the critical question of the decade? Well, certainly one of the big reasons is because it was one of the keystone elements of the 1992 presidential campaign. Uh, the uh, debate and the legislative packages that we're seeing arise uh, today are a, an outcropping of that. But the reason that it was an issue in the 1992 campaign uh, is because it's uh, very much a, a part of the national uh, consciousness that, one, health care costs have escalated out of control, and two, in addition to the uh, question of affordability is the question of availability to certain segments of our uh, society. I think those two elements uh, coalesced into a very vociferous uh, demand in the course of the 1992 campaign to uh, uh, draw a reform uh, proposal, and I think they put the uh, the uh, uh, candidates both uh, on alert that uh, whoever was elected was going to have to very quickly come up with a program that would meet uh, the various uh, demands of the constituencies. Uh, President Clinton, upon his election, immediately promised to introduce uh, a comprehensive national health care reform plan. They were a bit delayed in introducing that, but it's a complex problem and a very difficult uh, task. And uh, what we see now is the uh, product of, of a great deal of effort. But those are the highlights, as I see it, of why uh, this is such a, a major issue before us today. Marna, from a very practical point of view, what kinds of things do you think have made this a critical problem? I think that the number of, of patients and families that feel very frustrated with the process, uh, they feel that they have uh, limited access to certain types of care. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have talked with several people in the community that say, say that they have not been able to uh, have access to a physician or a service because they have Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, then once they are into the system, it's extremely cumbersome for someone that's uh, usually very ill to deal with the process of, of how to make sure that they're filling out the right forms and, and which person does this dollar go to, and uh, those are some of the issues that I hear from patients. Uh, one of the other things that was just mentioned to me on Friday was um, from a patient of ours that uh, was very concerned about uh, pre-existing conditions and the ability for her to change jobs or to move out of the state and what would happen since she does have cancer. How would she continue to be cared for? Did that mean that she was going to be locked into her job or, or stuck uh, in an area where she didn't want to be because she had the offer of, of uh, a proposal of marriage? So uh, it was very, uh, very concerning to her. Uh, Steve Sheen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question that I hope will involve both of you eventually, and I'll start with Randall. I want him to uh, to talk as someone who's had a chance to study a variety of health care plans, national health care plans that have been uh, proposed, and, and answer for us, if you can, what you see as the chief benefits of those plans. And then I'm going to ask Marna to talk from the perspective of, of a health care provider about what are the chief threats involved in, in, the, in the concept of, of national health care. Randall? Well, it's difficult to uh, keep straight a lot of the specific mm -hmm. details of all of these plans. Uh, in the early going, we had the Clinton plan and we had uh, one or two congressional uh, responses, uh, 
uh, many of the issues of which were very similar. But at this point, we've, we have a proliferation of plans. And as the debate evolves, there are a great number of constituencies that get involved in, uh, in the discussion of this and a lot of interest groups who have uh, devised their own means of, of uh, applying pressure to authors of various plans. I think the chief benefit of most of the more serious and the more uh, uh, cogent plans are that they provide coverage for virtually everyone, colloquially referred to as universal coverage. Uh, I think that the, uh, uh, the second uh, uh, most common element to the various uh, plans is the issue of portability, the ability to take an, insured, uh, an insurance uh, plan from one location to the other, from one job to another. Uh, third, I think the, uh, uh, the ability to spread out the cost of health care among uh, not only employers and not only the government and not only individual private uh, insurance policyholders, but uh, to begin to spread that across the board as uh, many people feel uh, the, that the cost will ultimately be borne by the individual, uh, however it's financed. So I think those three elements are probably the most common and the most beneficial of the plans that I've reviewed. And Marna, what worries you when you look at the various plans uh, as, as a health care provider? Um, I think the, the terms uh, universal coverage and universal access uh, are, are really important to understand, and those are the two major terms used by uh, two of the plans that are that are being looked at very closely, including the President's. Um, concern is access. Uh, I know that the American Hospital Association has very much supported a, a dignified approach to health care uh, for everyone. And I think this is a concern. Uh, again, the uh, pre-existing conditions, uh, being able to uh, seek physicians, uh, health care uh, provisions, uh, payment, finances. Um, those are, are some of the major things uh, that concern me. One thing that came out today that I really liked uh, was that uh, no matter what the plan, that each person as an individual needs to take responsibility in either doing what they need to do or asking the questions they need to ask to get the answers and to make them their concerns known to our uh, congressman about what is being uh, worked on very diligently on Capitol Hill right now. If I can follow up for just a second, Tony mm -hmm. Marno, when you say access, to, is, is your concern that the, the plans won't offer what they, what they uh, purport to offer, that there won't be true universal access, or are you saying my concern is how, where, who's going to provide it? I think that uh, if, you know, one of the um, concerns that there will need to be more primary care physici physicians uh, and that is something that we really need more of in this area. Uh, you know, if people can't access a primary care physician, how can they get the care they need, uh, whether they have Medicare, Medicaid, uh, or have nothing? Uh, you know, what do they do? Um, access into treatment for catastrophic illnesses. Um, will they be denied uh, referrals to specialists uh, because they have a catastrophic disease or chronic uh, disease? These are really, really concerns uh, for of patients and their families. Uh, another concern is that um, if they have a, a terminal or life-threatening disease, uh, will they be refused all levels of care. Uh, I know that some of the plans look at uh, like a DRG system or a numbered system that is based on our diagnoses and that if you're in the lower end of the spectrum you're denied care uh, or you won't be reimbursed for your care as it stands now in some of the, the, pro the areas that are, are doing uh, pilot programs and, and um, this is a very this is a big concern among our patients that you know it's my mother or my child and uh, who's going to determine who gets care and who doesn't. A lot of ethical issues out there that are going to need to be addressed. I think another thing that came out, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that came out of the speeches this morning, and I know that Senator Craig and Senator Kim Thorne and Congressman LaRocco all agreed, and, and that was bipartisan across the aisle, that mm -hmm. the final plan that would go to the President's desk would not uh, be exactly the plan the President introduced, but would be a combination mm -hmm of uh, ingredients from the different plans. 
uh, based upon that fact, and it seems like that there was also a consensus that something would be passed, uh, we don't know exactly the date, that there will be some change in health care legislation in this country. Uh, as we move down that road, and for both of you who've been listening carefully today and participating, what would be your recommendation uh, to both the general public and, uh, and also to those who make the policy decisions, or what should be some of the most important components that should not be, uh, in your opinion, left out of the plan? Myrna, would you like to start? Uh, again, uh, accessibility, um, coverage for people with pre-existing uh, illnesses, the ability to um, uh, go to their physician or to a private care physician and uh, be treated with dignity, um, have some say in what they're going to uh, be offered in, in uh, health care today. Uh, and one thing that I would like to encourage is that uh, we don't get in too big a hurry. I think that we need to be very careful that we look at all of the issues uh, as, as closely as possible to see what we can do and, and better and keep. There are good things about what we have today and uh, that came out uh, in several ways today from the senators and the congressmen that um, uh, we want to keep the good, the good parts of the, of the health care system that we have today, but then uh, rework some of the things that are not so good and uh, make some things available that have not been available to all, all uh, payers or lives. Randall, you also heard uh, in the input that you got from the audience that uh, there were some things that some citizens thought uh, that should be included that are not in any of the plans. Myrna's already covered some areas. Would you have other recommendations? Uh, things to either leave in or to take out? Well, uh, one of the uh, issues that was raised earlier today uh, that appears to me to be omitted, uh, at least on the short term, from many of the plans is psychiatric and uh, psychological care. Mm -hmm. I think it is folly to consider uh, health care on a national uh, or global basis without taking into account the need for psychiatric and, and psychological care as a component of the overall uh, consideration of health care. I would plug that back into the equation immediately uh, in the early going. Uh, I, I would say also that where uh, you heard some concerns articulated earlier from, from uh, constituencies within this overall debate that also appear to have been left out or certainly are not getting the amount of ink and attention that uh, than, than some of the other issues are. Uh, I'm trying to cite uh, some particular examples. I think the psych psychiatric care is probably the, the most prominently articulated one. But there are other uh, individual concerns that are simply uh, not getting looked at in the, you know, the global uh, consideration of all this. Uh, I would like to make one point, uh, as Marna pointed out. We do have an excellent health care system. Uh, it's often cited as the best in the world. I think it's a great base to begin to build on, and I think that uh, if we are to codify some of those obvious deficiencies, uh, the affordability issue uh, with regard to uh, the, the escalating costs, sometimes uh, in areas that are obviously uh, way out of proportion to reality, uh, I think that we can put a legislative measure uh, into effect toward the end of this uh, congressional uh, session, or I should say toward the end of this summer, and then build on that. I think uh, expecting a radical uh, reform of health care before the end of this uh, calendar year or while this Congress is still sitting, I think that's probably asking too much. I also hear you saying that <clears throat> following the passage that there may be some adjustments later on. Uh, hope, well, there would, there would certainly be adjustments uh, uh, later on in order to achieve what we all, I think, uh, agree is a, a, an ideal. Uh, I think to try to achieve that ideal within the uh, time constraints uh, that we've heard bandied about, the end of the summer, the end of the uh, prior to the uh, 94 congressional elections, uh, and perhaps even uh, with an issue of this complexity even before the end of this presidential term, uh, I think you have to begin to uh, take a look at that from the perspective of is it practical to get this uh, comprehensive legislation passed in that uh, relatively short period of time? Janelle Burke. 
we have a very short time left. Time has gone so rapidly today, but I, I do want to ask a question. There are two major groups that probably are involved a, a lot in this. That is the health care providers themselves and also the insurance companies. Uh, Randall, what changes do you see for the insurance companies on the horizon? Well, I think that's going to be one of the areas where the most scrutiny is going to be focused. Uh, because uh, the insurance companies, for good, both good and bad reasons, both valid and invalid, have garnered a rather uh, checkered reputation throughout the evolution of this whole uh, uh, debate. Uh, there are going to have to be some accountability measures, and that includes not only insurance, uh, but also as, as the insurance uh, industry links up with the health care provider at the facility level. Uh, I think the, the, there's going to need to be some accountability there. I think there's going to have to be some restraint and some responsibility with regard to cost setting and allocation of costs and so forth. Uh, in my judgment, the, uh, uh, the insurance industry uh, and on a secondary level from that, the actual facilities themselves, the health care uh, provider organizations, the administrators are going to uh, uh, they're going to be uh, uh, held up to a very high standard of, uh, of performance in any reform measure. And uh, Marna, what do mm -hmm. you see for the health care provider? You're a health care provider. Uh, what do you see as the kinds of places that you're going to be affected personally? I think that we're going to have to do what we do a whole lot better uh, and more cost effectively. Uh, some of the things have felt good to do them this way. I think that we are going to have to maintain focus <coughs> on the patient and the care uh, that, that is needed for that patient and, and family. They are a unit and to involve them in the process and to be involved with the hospital system as a whole and the physicians in the, in the community. Uh, and as Randall said, with the insurance or the payers uh, to uh, develop ways to purchase services in a, in a more cost-effective way and to provide them uh, at a cheaper rate or so that we can have more to spread around to everyone. On that note, I want to bring the program to a conclusion and I want to thank both of our guests here and our panel for being with us today. It's a, a very, very important subject and we're just going to be delving into this over a five-week series with our viewers uh, uh, throughout the Northwest. Thank you both for being here today. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you found this program most informative and it is the beginning of a five-week series as I indicated. When we come back to you next week, we're going to talk about the subtopic under health coverage of private sponsored versus government sponsored programs. I hope you'll be with us then. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.